Great. So I'm trying to be logged in on the Zoom on my iPad also. Hopefully that will be, make it more robust. OK, so a couple of logistics related things. Uh, first of all, the homework five will be released on the morning of November 4, and again due in a week. And second thing is about the second midterm. This will be released on the morning of November 2, uh, Monday. And it's going to be very different, possibly from anything you have done in most of your classes. It will have a selection of five research papers, actual publications in different fields, such as biochemistry, material science, maybe even a paper about geology and exploring volcanoes or whatever. It will be five different papers. And uh, oh, I have a feedback loop. So let's see how this Zoom thing is from both. Okay, so there will be five different papers. You will be randomly assigned to teams of five. So uh, I will be writing a code which will pick out your names and I, can, I will even show you the code to make sure that you agree that it is completely random. And uh, you will have teams of five. Each team, there is a bit of, I'm going to log out of my Zoom here because I can hear myself and it's very strange. Let's hope it works. Cool. So each team will have to meet and on online or whichever way you uh, how uh, online of course I guess and you will have to pick a paper from the five now almost certainly you won't have the same first choice of your paper so this is an act in reaching a consensus you will have to decide as a team you will it's it's if all five of you pick, picked one paper then then of course then life is simpler but if you had different choices you will have to discuss and figure out which paper to pick once you do that you have three weeks to work on this, to read on this. You can meet each other and work on this. And uh, the idea will be that you will be submitting, your answer will be of two forms. First of all, you will be submitting a report. What I need from you in the report will be very well specified when I actually release the papers and the midterm. There will be four or five things. You will have to make a figure illustrating the main point of the paper and this and that and talk about what are the things you liked? What are the things you did not like? Blah, blah, blah. Every team member will have their own report, which means you will have your own figure. You can discuss. The whole idea is to discuss, so it's completely open discussion, but your reports will be different. However, every team will make one presentation. So for a team of five, there will be one presentation and five reports. This presentation you can record on Zoom or any other recording software that you have and you can discuss who whichever in uh, u5 is most comfortable recording it and has the best audio or whatever your uh, recordings will be around four minutes long or so again it will be specified in the actual exam and they will all be made available in a google drive so you can see what everyone has done it's quite possible that all of you end up picking the same paper like every Nine, there will be 20 teams and it's possible all 20 of you pick the same paper but i am extremely i doubt it i doubt it will happen i did this two years ago also in 481 and there was a very wide distribution of papers that people picked so this is how the second midterm will be the second thing i wanted to discuss is i just put up the uh, screenshot on slack and I have opened it over here. This is a screenshot detailing the list of all remaining, remaining homeworks and uh, midterm and final exam. So the fourth homework is already out, which is due on 28th October. The second midterm will be out on 11-2, due on 11-23, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, the fifth homework is as per here, and there will be two homeworks after this, one before Thanksgiving and one right after Thanksgiving. The final exam will be released on 11th of December in the morning. You will have one full week to do it, okay? Uh, full one week and the last class will be 9th of December. So this means that and the last class will be completely review. So basically 8th of December, 9th of December, 10th of December, three days is all about discussion. You can post whatever you want on Slack, ask me any question, we will, I, I might have an 
I will probably have extra office hours to talk to you, discuss questions with you. So it's lots of discussion on 11th of December, once the final is released, it will be no Slack questions. You can ask me in direct message, of course, if you think anything is wrong, and most likely I will tell you, no, it's not. But if it is, I will declare it to the class through Slack and through email. And the other thing that is important for releasing the exam, so UMD has official course evaluations due until 15th December. Now, if I wait to release the exam after 15th December, I won't be able to give you that much time to do it because, you know, it's too, too close to Christmas. I don't want to have a really bad holiday just working. It will be not, it won't be a bad exam. You will, you will have fun, hopefully type one. But uh, one requirement I will have as a request is that the course evaluations open on 3rd of December and I will release the exam only when 90% students have submitted evaluation. This is the historical number, typically 80 to, 80 to 95 persons do that. So I will send you a few reminders. It's just a brief questionnaire and it's completely anonymous. All I can see is how, what is the response rate? So if, so it's in everyone's interest to fill that up and then the exam will be released 11th of December at 7 a.m. And uh, it will be very similar to the second mid, uh, to the first midterm. It will cover all sorts of topics. It will, it will require you to integrate things. It will require you to watch the class videos. So those of you who have been attending class videos live or watching them later will have a distinct advantage. No question asked. There will be problems that if you just look at the notes, it might not make a lot of sense. But if you have watched the videos or participated in them, it will make sense. Any questions? You can ask me questions later on Slack also. Okay, great. So today, oh, by the way, I also want to point out something. There is a very cool seminar happening today at 4 p.m by a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at UC San Diego. Her work was recently featured. Okay, maybe you know the trick to open New York Times when you don't have a subscription is to open it incognito. So her work was recently featured in New York Times. If you had to print, think it was like a full two page thing. And she will be talking about her work. This, these are her images, you know, Amaro Lab in today's 4 p.m. biophysics seminar. I think I already posted. Uh, these are all from molecular dynamic simulation. So she she teaches the PCAM at UC San Diego, and she uses it to study things like that. So it should be a very cool seminar. If you, you can see how high is the resolution. These are all completely atomistic simulations of coronavirus. And what they're trying to figure out is to wear and go and bind to the receptor in order to come up with a potent and specific drug. So this is at 4 p.m. today. And uh, I posted a link earlier and I will post it again. So if, if you are available, please try to join. It will be a good seminar and it will give you, especially for the biochemists, but even for others, it will give you perspective into how these thermodynamics is useful to do things like that. Okay, great. So if no questions, let's talk about Gibbs energy. So last time I asked you to think about the variation of Gibbs energy with pressure at constant temperature. Well, we know this is volume. How do we know this is volume? We know this is volume from the fundamental equation for dG, which is Vdp minus Sdt, right? So partial G by partial P at constant T is volume. We know this. And what we want to do next is to plot it out. We want to make a plot of Gibbs energy versus pressure for all three. So once again, we know, so, okay. First we have to think about what happens at zero pressure. At zero pressure, which thing is going to have the highest free energy? G gas, G liquid, or G solid? And to give you a hint here, G is equal to H 
minus Tf is equal to U plus PV minus Ts. So at P is equal to zero, G is equal to U minus Ts. So on this basis, what can you say about the relative locations of G gas, G liquid, and G solid? Any idea at zero pressure? Anyone wants to help me? The G gas would still be the one with the highest Gibbs free energy. The gas? Yes. Why is that so, Elliot? Uh, because it has the most uh, entropy and, oh, never mind, it would be the opposite. Ah, uh, you got confused, right? It has the highest yeah. free energy. Correct? Yeah, it has, I was thinking that temperature and, and entropy yeah. are high, but then it's extracted, so it's actually... Yeah. As per U, we know that U gas is more than U liquid is more than U solid, right? How do we know that? We have to think about the interaction curve. The same idea as last time, that on an interaction curve, solid is close to equilibrium, liquid is further out, gas is further out. So it's hard to judge just from this basis that which thing will be highest. Just on this basis, there is a competition. U gas is more than U solid is more than U liquid, but S gas is more than S solid is more than S liquid at zero pressure. So it's hard to say. So you have to take my word here that it is still typically gas, solid, liquid. That order, but I'm not really proving it. And the reason why it does not matter very much in this case is as follows. The reason why it does not matter is that V gas is much more than V liquid, is much more than V solid. This we agree on, right? A gas typically acquires much more volume than a liquid or much more volume and even much more volume than a solid. So this means that the gas curve will rise very steeply the solid curve will rise less, or oh, what did I do here? I, sorry, this is my wrong. Gas, liquid, solid. And the solid curve will rise even less steeply. So even if you had the order on the zero axis, P is equal to zero axis different, it won't matter much very quickly because the partial G by partial P for a gas partial G by partial P at constant T for a gas is much more than partial G by partial P at constant T for a liquid, much more than partial G by partial P at constant T for solid. So here to be precise, it's a good idea to not keep this one as much more. The difference between volume of solid and liquid typically tends to be less than the difference between the volume of gas and liquid. So the much more really applies to uh, gas, gas liquid, gas solid, not so much uh, solid liquid, okay? So, <clears throat> so that explains our curve for G versus pressure. It doesn't have transitions like we had in G versus temperature. That was kind of cooler. So let's work on this a bit mathematically and see what we can do with this. So what do we have so far? What, what we have written so far is partial G, partial G by partial T at constant P is equal to minus S directly from this relation on the top and partial G by partial, yeah, actually let's, let's just work with this one and see what we can do. So we know partial G by partial T at constant P is equal to minus S. But what do we know about G? We know that G is equal to h minus ts right therefore minus ts is equal to g minus s h or minus s is equal to g minus h by t right therefore if we take this and we take this both these things together we can write down partial g by partial t at constant p is equal to g minus h by t the frozen frozen Oh yeah, and so it begins, hopefully not.
I tried to get a connector for the <clears throat> uh, for the iPad Pro with computer USB, but that didn't work. So that plan failed. So what I've done here is to take this definition of partial G by partial T at constant T from Maxwell relation. And this one, which we just showed from S. By the way, I think it was Jason who asked on Slack if we have to derive Maxwell relation all the time. No, things such as even like this relation, you can just state it, you don't have to derive it. We know that it exists. And if you can state it without deriving, that's totally fine. Of course, once in a while you will be asked to derive it, then you have to derive it, as in problem number four. But in general, you can use it directly. You don't have to start from scratch every single time. So by mixing both of these, by mixing equation one with equation two, we get partial G by partial T at constant P is equal to G minus H by T. So that is equal to G by T minus H by T. So what we're trying to do with all of this right here is to derive a relation between Gibbs energy and enthalpy. Why will that be useful? It will be useful because enthalpy for a reaction can be measured through heat capacity. If we can measure heat capacity, which is typically the easiest thing to measure, we can go and talk about the enthalpy. And if we can connect enthalpy with Gibbs energy, maybe we can use this relation, what we have found about enthalpy to find about Gibbs free energy. So you will see this in the paper actually, in, in the research papers that you will do for midterm two, that relations like this are very useful. So for now, it's just gonna be a bit of algebra. So let's look at partial of G over T by partial T at constant P, okay? Everyone's favorite calculus rule is product rule. This can be written as one by T partial G by partial T at constant P plus G partial one over T by partial T at constant P. This becomes one over T partial G by partial T at constant P minus G over T square. Or this whole thing becomes one over T partial G by partial T at constant P minus G over T. Now, we have just seen this partial G by partial T at constant P minus G over T. Where have we seen this? Right here, partial G by partial T at constant P minus G over T is equal to minus H over T, right? So this is equal to minus H over T square using equation number three. frozen in. Okay, I'm going to try something today, which is to turn off my video and just write Zoom directly from the iPad. So just give me, can I do that from the very beginning? No, it's not a good idea to do it midway because the video recording will be distorted. So next time that's what I'm gonna try if it continues to be very, irritating today, which is this so far. So we had partial G by partial T at constant P minus G by T inside square brackets. And we have seen this before in equation three. So we get partial. So, so the end here is that we get a relation connecting partial G by T partial of G by T with respect to T with respect to minus H by T square. And this relation is so important and so useful that it has a name of its own. I'll write down the relation. We just showed that partial G over T by partial T at constant P is equal to minus H over T square. So it's a relation of how the Gibbs energy varies, not specifically Gibbs energy, but Gibbs energy divided by temperature in terms of the enthalpy. And this has a name, this is called Gibbs 
Helmholtz equation. Even though the Helmholtz free energy doesn't show up on the right side, so it can be a bit confusing. It's got, it could have been called Gibbs enthalpy equation, but Gibbs and Helmholtz thought about it together. And that's why it's called Gibbs-Helmholtz uh, equation. And uh, it is very useful, for example, if you have a chemical reaction for you know, some generic reaction, A plus B going to C. And you have done calorimetry for this reaction. You have measured CP from your calorimetry and CP has allowed you to get the delta H for this reaction. Then you can write down that partial delta G for this reaction divided by T by partial T at constant P is equal to minus delta H divided by T square. So here we are using the Gibbs Helmholtz equation for a chemical reaction where we measure delta H and we can use it to calculate the free energy change. And why do we care about Gibbs free energy change? Because, so yeah, so can anyone tell me as to why would getting delta G for a reaction be superior or more useful than getting delta H for a reaction. Why do we want this more? And this, we are like, uh, maybe, but this is what we really care for. Any maybe ideas why? It's because it's that tells um, spontaneity. Yeah, absolutely correct, Noel and Abby. Because delta G under constant temperature and pressure tells us the spontaneity of the reaction. You might get delta H negative, positive, who cares? But if you want to see whether the reaction is going to proceed forward or backward, does G take into account the temperature? What do you mean by that? G depends on temperature, right? G is a function of temperature. So if you mean that does G vary with temperature? Yes, sure it does. That's, yeah, it, absolutely. G is a function of temperature, right? G is equal to H minus T, so it does. Okay, great. So what did we do here? What we did was to look at, we looked at variation of G, specifically of G over T. We didn't directly look at G, we looked at G divided by T. with respect to temperature. Now, let's look at variation of G with respect to pressure. So we kind of did this thing in the plot. We already drew a figure for this, right? We drew a pressure, a figure for how G varies with pressure. And last time we drew a figure for how G varies with temperature and we are looking at that in a slightly more rigorous manner and deriving some useful equations due to that. This one is going to lead to a concept called fugacity, which is my nemesis. I don't like it very much. It always confuses me and you will see what I mean. Today you will probably feel like, oh, it's simple. Professor Tiwari is kind of stupid. Why does this confuse anyone? This is so simple. It gets really confusing in practical applications of thermodynamics when you have mixtures or solutions of five things existing together. This concept of fugacity that we are going to introduce today, will uh, that's how you lose your hair by thinking about fugacity too much. Today, it will be simple. So how do we get there? So our idea here is that partial G by partial P at constant T is equal to volume, right? We just showed this, how did we show this? By looking at dG is equal to V dP minus S dT. So we have partial G by partial T is equal to volume. So at constant temperature, if we vary pressure from Pi to Pf, some initial pressure to, oops, stupid screen frozen in. Any questions about Gibbs Helmholtz equation? See, you all should ask me questions. There is one very practical example, uh, uh, benefit for asking questions that if you ask me questions, I won't be able to cover as much material. That might be a good thing, right? Or maybe not, maybe you want me to cover a lot of material. So if you ask me questions, I will be slowed down.
Okay, let's try what I was doing in the beginning, which is to log in in Zoom over here. And let's see. Oh, again, such a lag. This is terrible. Okay, is there any sort of echo or anything in my audio? No. Okay, cool. let's see if this works. Might be the magic formula. Okay, so at constant temperature, if we vary pressure from PI to PF, can we use this equation? Yes, we can say that by integrating it, G at some final pressure PF should be equal to G. <laughs> Fugacity would be funny. That would be a better name. No, it's fugacity. We haven't talked about it yet. It will happen in a moment. It's 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 a horrible. It's a painful concept. So treat it with respect. So this week we are going to have two new concepts: fugacity today and chemical potential, most likely on Wednesday or maybe even today. These are both very important concepts central to thermodynamics. There's a lot of concepts in thermo. I know it's a heavy class. So we can integrate this equation and write it as PI to PF integral VDP, correct? Nothing wrong about that. We have just integrated at constant temperature. We can do this. So now we can't do much with this. It's like, oh, sure, it's an integral. What do we do with this? Nothing. Now, if we assume perfect gas, then V is equal to RT by P. I know there should be N also, but I'm talking about constant composition system. So I'm just ignoring that. Let's say per, per mole of gas. So V is equal to RT by P. So we can put this in this equation, which is equation number four. Use in equation four to get G of PF is equal to G of PI plus RT. Temperature goes out. We are talking about constant temperature. PI to PF, VDP. RT we have already pulled out, so DP by P. And now we can integrate this, and this will look like G of PF is equal to G of PI plus RT ln PF by PI, equation number five. Okay, what do we do with this? Well, we haven't really talked much about PI. We can set PI as some uh, reference pressure. Let's say, so we, we have so far G of PF is equal to G of PI plus RT ln PF by PI. Let's set PI as some reference pressure P naught. Okay, some pressure P naught. Which one is equation three? Wait, which is equation three? the predecessor to gibbs helmholtz equation. I just numbered them so there is nothing special about this. It's just so if we have to use it later. gibbs helmholtz equation, I did not really number. That's the gibbs helmholtz equation in two forms. This is without a reaction and this is for a reaction. They are basically the same thing. Cool. So if we set some reference pressure P0 at which G of PI is equal to G naught. Then we can say G is equal to G naught plus RT ln P by P naught. Okay, so we have just removed the I and F. We are saying the F is some pressure P at which we are interested. So G is Gibbs free energy 
at pressure P. And the, so this is our replacement for PF and the replacement for PI is P naught. Looks like we are not freezing. This suggestion came from Sasha Coates Park, so if it works, I owe you, Sasha. I can't give you more participation points, so it's, I owe you virtually. Normally in the past semester, when a student would do very well in the exam or something, I would take like few of the students out for ice cream at Maryland Dairy. That's not gonna happen this year. So we'll figure out another way. So let's look at this equation and try to draw it. What would happen to G as a function? And let's say this is my P naught, some reference value P naught. And I have some G naught at this reference value G naught. What I want you to think about next, can I pass it on to the next one? What, the ice cream? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, cool. So what would happen to G naught as P tends to zero, as the pressure tends to zero? And this is for an ideal gas, okay? This is for a perfect gas only. This will not apply. This is super, super important. That this equation, which I'm going to number because it's useful, equation number six is valid only for perfect gas. So what will happen to G as P tends to zero? Any ideas? What is log of zero? One. Negative infinity. Negative infinity, right? Log of zero means log of x is equal, yeah. Anything, log of zero is negative infinity to any base because anything raised to the power minus infinity goes to zero. This is, so not plus infinity, otherwise, otherwise see, it's minus infinity. So it starts from minus infinity and it goes something like this. That's our curve. So this is interesting that for a perfect gas, the free energy, Gibbs free energy goes to minus infinity and when I was an undergrad, my thermodynamics professor was so strict. And just to remind you, this was my undergrad was in material science. More specifically, it was in something called metallurgical engineering, which is old school material science. My professor was so strict that anytime if I would draw a G curve versus P and I would draw it casually like this, he would cut it and give me zero points. This is an important concept that G goes to minus infinity for a perfect gas as pressure tends to zero. So it means that when the pressure is zero, what does, why, and this is worth thinking about a little bit. Why did this happen? So a perfect gas PV is equal to RT. Let's just think about one mole. So P is equal to RT by V or V is equal to RT by P. So as the pressure tends to zero, the volume tends to infinity, right? At a constant temperature. So you are in infinite volume. And what this is really telling you is that when you are at infinite volume in a perfect gas and you decrease the volume slightly. Yeah, I want you to think about it and discuss. This is, this is, I want people to post hypothesis on Slack as to how can they physically justify this is going. This is intriguing. And I want you to think as to why does it make sense for a perfect gas that the free energy goes to minus infinity. And please post this and I'm, also, I'm, 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 I'm gonna see what you think and I'm gonna to respond to that. So this is important. Mathematically, you can see why it happens, no problem, but physically, why did this happen? Think about this. Okay. So this equation number six is only for perfect gas for the fifth time because it's such an important, you will see such equations many times and it's easy to write it down for non-perfect gas also. It's got a very simple form. Wouldn't it be very nice if the Gibbs free energy varied only as the log of pressure, right? We could vary the pressure and we could just say what would happen to the Gibbs free energy. It would be very useful, but alas, it happens only for an ideal gas. People liked this form so much 
people loved equation six so much that they introduced a similar form and I'm going to write it in notes because 40 of you are not in the classroom and 20 of them will probably not even watch the video. So I want to write it down here clearly. Otherwise notes are not really complete. They have to be seen read with the video. They introduced a similar form for any gas, that is any real gas in general. How did they do that? They said, well, let's pick some P equal to P naught at which we measure G is equal to G naught. Okay, and my zero went into subscript, superscript here. So I guess really, I mean, it's not gonna create confusion, but just to be consistent, let's use superscript everywhere. Before a similar form, it says introduced in my crappy handwriting. So at which G is equal to G naught. Okay, this, this you can do for any gas, right? You pick a pressure and you go and measure the Gibbs energy, doing whatever you want. Then they say, now let's look at how G varies with pressure. Now, if you look at how G varies with pressure, it's not going to look at RT ln P by P naught, right? Because it's not ideal, but it will say, let's call it F. Let's measure the G and fit it to a logarithmic equation. And whatever that we get out of it is our fugacity or uh, not frugacity as Elizabeth called it, it's fugacity, okay? So it's a very complicated way of introducing a quantity, but you can see why they did it. So in other words, F is de defined as, you can do the math here, you can see, G minus G naught is equal to RT ln F by P naught, or ln f over p naught is equal to g minus g naught by rt or f is equal to p naught e to the power g minus g naught by rt right so that's how that's our fugacity and you can see it's a it's a strange definition and these things happen in thermo quite a lot they will happen also when we go to activities and things like that so we have a relation what did we do here we had g is equal to g naught plus rt ln p by p naught for perfect gas this would mean that G versus P for a perfect gas would look something like this. And whether we have, where, where, where we have our P naught. Now you go do an actual experiment. Your actual experiment, you will get some data points. So we agree that at G is equal to P naught, the data point, we have G naught. So we have some G naught there, but your data points might be distributed something like this. Right? This might be your real data point or your real data point might be distributed Right, there will be some distribution which won't conform to this It could even look funky, it might even go down, who knows, it could be some complicated distribution But what you're doing there is to take the real distribution and uh, <clears throat> get fugacity out of it. So what do I mean by this? 
What I mean by this requires one more definition, which is that F is equal to phi multiplied by P. This phi over here is fugacity coefficient. So what would be phi for a perfect gas? Any ideas? One. One, perfect. And if attractive, so we know something about, who answered that? Who do I have? Oh, that was me, Sangyo. Sangyo, let's, let's hold you here, Sangyo. Don't go away. <laughs> okay. For a perfect gas, we know there are no attractive or repulsive forces, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we had attractive forces dominating in the gas, if the attractive forces dominated, what can you say about phi? Will it be negative, positive, more than one, less than one? Can you say anything? Um, that is a complicated concept. I don't have an idea about that. Okay, no problem, don't worry, thanks. But you are absolutely correct that phi is equal to one for a perfect guess. And uh, if attractive forces dominate, then what do we expect phi to be? Let's think through this. So we know that G is equal to G naught plus RT ln P by P naught. If attractive forces dominate, would it make the pressure feel like it is higher or it is lower? I think higher. Lower. Think through it. Lower. Lower, why? Because if the molecules are attracted to each other, then they're going to be hitting the walls of the container a lot. Correct. No. So the molecules like each other. They want to get tighter and tighter. You know, they don't want to. Pressure does not come from molecules on each other. Pressure comes from the bombardment against the walls. And they are like, oh, no, no, let's hang out together. It's all cool. They don't want to bombard against the walls. So attractive forces dominating means pressure lower than ideal gas. Have we seen this mathematically before that attractive forces leads to pressure lower than an ideal gas? Van der Waals. Van der Waals, exactly. We, that's what we saw for a Van der Waals, that PV is equal to NRT, we wrote as P is equal to NRT V minus NB, and minus NA squared by V squared. Remember this minus term? That was the whole thing, that the attractive forces, which, allow, which occur due to Van der Waals forces or whatever reason, make the pressure lower. So if attractive forces dominate, this is going to be smaller than one. And if repulsive forces dominate, so this is for perfect gas, this is for attractive forces. And if repulsive forces dominate, it is going to be higher than one. This is our fugacity coefficient. In other words, F is equal to P for an ideal gas, the fugacity, versus pressure. F is fugacity is less than P if attractive forces dominate. And F is more than P if repulsive forces dominate. How will this look like in a plot? It will look such as we are drawing a G versus P plot. And let's say this is the plot for an ideal gas. So for a real gas, if attractive forces dominate, at any given pressure, the free energy will be lower than what you have coming from an ideal gas. So it will look something like this. So at low pressure, maybe the attractive forces dominate. And then maybe at high pressure, it flips and goes to the other side. So this over here would mean that until you have this crossover, attractive forces dominate. And once you have on the other side of the crossover, you have repulsive forces dominate. And I'm not saying that without loss of generality, this will always be 
a plot like this. Typically, this is what tends to happen, but it's not always true. But the lesson to be taken here is that anytime you perform the measurement of G versus P, you can draw the plot for an ideal gas. How do you do that? You fix one data point, some P naught or some other data point, and you draw the plot for an ideal gas. And then you plot your actual measurements and you can compare them. And this will give you a sense in your material as to what's going on, whether you have attractive forces or repulsive forces. Typically having a crossover shows you something strange is happening in the material. Maybe a phase transition is happening around then. Maybe the protein is unfolding. Maybe the DNA is losing its double helical structure. Maybe the battery is stopping to work. Something is going on. Why did the attractive forces suddenly change and it, become, it becomes a more dominant system for repulsive forces? So that's our first introduction to the beast of fugacity. This beast is going to go into the background. It will not show up until we get to solutions. Then it will come and you will have to remember this. Next class, we are going to talk about another concept which will not disappear so quickly. So fugacity came today and went away. It will come back again. Next time, however, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about chemical potential or its symbol is mu. Why will we talk about mu? Because so far what we have done for Gibbs energy or anything like that is to look at relations where, you know, dg is equal to vdp minus sdt. We have completely ignored the role of composition. Next time we can see, we will see how to account for composition in a general, because most of the things that we do are not just made of one component system, right? You have many different species talking to each other and the reactions are happening, compositions are changing. So if at the end of physical chemistry, you were able to deal with systems made up of only iron or only vanadium or only carbon, then we are not a very good physical chemist. You need to be able to deal with systems made up of different number of components of different systems. That's where this chemical potential will come in. This will lead us to another Gibbs equation called Gibbs to Hem equation, which is, you can read up on it. And it's, it's, it's a, the proof is slightly complicated. So if you read up, it might help you. And then we will go to the concept of phase followed by phase diagrams and Gibbs phase rule. So you can see Gibbs plays a lot of role in thermodynamics. In fact, people like Einstein used to think he is the most important scientist ever. You know, if you, if you go on the streets and ask someone about Newton or Einstein, they would know the name. I'm ready to bet not a lot of people will know the name of Gibbs. However, Gibbs has influenced modern science and everything that we do, possibly more than any other scientist in the world. So no office hours for me today. I will be having office hours next week. Connor, will you be having office hours tomorrow? If you're there? Yes. Okay, great. So please ask questions to Connor and post questions on Slack and see you all on Wednesday.